At the University of Maryland School of Medicine, research breakthroughs are leading to innovative treatments, bringing the future into focus. For Kimberly Spletter, an active athlete only in her 50s, a diagnosis of Parkinson's was devastating. Parkinson's is progressive, so you know it's not going to get better. I had lost my balance. I couldn't ride. Um, no running. I hadn't run. You know, I couldn't walk for any distance. Basically, anything with movement, I, I couldn't do it. My whole life had definitely changed, not for the better. Kimberly's only hope was a clinical trial being conducted at the University of Maryland School of Medicine that involved a combination of two technologies, MRI and focused ultrasound. So the MR part helps you identify the target. And it also allows you to see the development of the lesion. You can align the focused ultrasound beam, if you will, with the target. So you can see that you're in the right spot because the symptoms are going away and you can make sure that there's no side effects. The process took about two hours and Kimberly had no idea of what she could expect. Right hand, finger taps. Left foot flap at the ankle. They said, okay, go ahead and, and try and stand up. And I'm like thinking, hmm, I think I'm gonna fall. And they're like, okay, go ahead and get up. And I'm like, and then finally I got my foot down there and I was like, I can stand. And then I started walking and you can hear me say, I can walk, I can walk. It was absolutely astonishing. She stood up and she sort of skipped over to her family who were, members of her family were in the next room. She was completely different. I mean, it was, it was very dramatic effect and the whole family started crying happily. It was like magic, yeah. It, it was impressive, even, even for somebody who's been around for a while, it was, it, was, it was impressive, yeah. It is a miracle, it really is a miracle. It's absolutely amazing. Definitely giving us hope. The Maryland Proton Treatment Center is one of only 12 centers in the country and the first on the East Coast to offer intensity modulated proton therapy, giving hope to thousands of cancer patients. Because of its pencil beam precision, it's particularly beneficial in treating brain tumors. So trying to get high dose, high enough dose to get rid of the tumor without putting at risk some of the surrounding normal structures, it's, it's virtually impossible to do with standard radiation. So Daryl came to me with a very serious problem. He had a very large tumor that was pressing on the most sensitive part of his brain, his brain stem. After two surgeries, there was still tumor left behind. Daryl's only option was the precision accuracy of proton beam radiation. So he, that's what he had, and he did very well. He's uh, done remarkably well, he's a fireman, He's still a fireman. He doesn't go into burning buildings anymore, but he probably could if he wanted to. It was a miracle, you know. I mean, I, mean, you know, I, I was led here, and you know, my being alive is a tribute to you. I think we are on a new frontier for treating cancer of the brain. We've expanded our team, we've expanded our technology, and uh, we should be able to do great things. As a cancer physician, I think the, the, the greatest thing you give a patient is hope and that hope is really driven by what you can offer a patient. Uh, and the, the things I'm excited about is we have a tool chest here now at the Greenenbaum Cancer Center that it has every possible tool a patient can have to have the best outcome and the best quality of life. In laboratories throughout the School of Medicine, the search accelerates for the elusive causes of cancer. Using molecular genetics, Dr. Hotop has found a bacteria which she believes may be the culprit in some cancers. And what we're looking for when we're looking at the human genome is we're looking, we see little bits of pieces of bacterial DNA that seem to be making it into the human genome. And we are finding that in tumors. And so we think that there might be a role for bacterial DNA um, in the formation of tumors. These bacteria may already be living in you or maybe in the food you consume or come from an infection. 
I'm hoping with this research that we'll be able to demonstrate that these mutations from these bacteria are causing cancer and that we'll be able to develop either prevention strategies or treatment strategies based on these results. At the School of Medicine, our faculty diagnose and treat the most rare and the most common life-threatening heart conditions with breakthrough procedures and the innovative devices they have developed. Hey, Howard. Hello, Dr. Gowney. How are you doing? You look great. <laughs> they diagnosed a calcification on my heart valve, and my one daughter, Penny, said, Dad, you have to go to the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Gowney is a specialist of mitral valves. And we, uh, I'd want you to, I want you to go there. We'll get you arranged for you to go now. Mr. Brown had an extremely unusual uh, problem with his mitral valve. We operated on him immediately, and what we were able to do was to open up this small space, this cavity, and remove all that dangerous liquid calcium, and at the same time, we were able to fix his valve. A large percentage of Dr. Gammy's cases require operations for heart valve disease. Hi, Dr. Gammy. Hey, how's it going? Nice to see you. How are you, Stacy? Stacy Foxwell's leaky mitral valve is a condition his team repairs several hundred times a year. A leaky mitral valve is a bad thing to have. It causes the heart to work twice as hard, 24-7, and the heart doesn't like that. It tends to get bigger and weaker over time, and we want to avoid uh, things like that. Oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know he was gonna change my life. I didn't know that I really needed the surgery. It's the miracle of what they could do that I will never have seen and never will really understand but they fixed my heart. Researchers at the University of Maryland School of Medicine are exploring new solutions for individuals with heart failure over the age of 70, for whom heart transplantation is not an option. And so then we're looking at that option for heart pump. And um, so those, all those folks, which are thousands, tens of thousands of, of patients, could potentially uh, really do well with these heart pumps and not need transplant. These heart pumps, called left ventricular assist devices, could possibly provide many years of life for patients. So those are implantable pumps that help the, the weak heart pump uh, when, when, they, when that heart can no longer do the job. Um, so we're involved in that research and that's, um, we really sort of like to brag about that because we've been in every single one of the trials. Integrative medicine offers uh, patients with heart disease uh, more therapeutic options, for one. Um, we know in, in cardiology that our doctors are well trained in the treatment of advanced disease, but patients want information and help with prevention and self-care. So the big question is really, how do we prevent the disease from happening in the first place? Prevention of heart disease is one of the many initiatives of the Center for Integrative Medicine, recognized as the nation's first associated with a medical school. We like to see how can we create heart health as opposed to heart disease. And that could be high blood pressure, that could be coronary artery disease. And so take uh, high blood pressure, there are things that we can do such as Mindfulness meditation, transcendental meditation, uh, yoga, laughter, music, all things that count can counteract uh, the effects of, of stress. Genetic testing and personalized medicine are already being used to determine the efficacy of certain medications. As one of the new frontiers in medicine, our students are being introduced to genetic testing in their first year. So this isn't just putting the medical students at Maryland ahead of the game of other medical students, which it very well is. This is a tool and learning how to use this tool is something that needs to be implemented now. Also unique for our students is the potential to participate in entrepreneurship teams designed to explore both the process and partnerships necessary for inventing new medical devices or therapeutic agents. As a physician, as somebody seeing all these clinical issues, you're going to come across a scenario where you really wish you just had a given device or a given solution. 
um, and maybe you can even come up with an idea to that solution. The school's been very supportive in helping us push this entrepreneurship project along. Whenever we try to contact faculty, they're extremely receptive, extremely responsive, and everybody has an idea that they'd like to see put into, a, put it, put into existence as a product or a device. The School of Medicine's long-established tradition of community service is the foundation of who we are, with our faculty and students providing both educational outreach and needed health services. Students working at community sites gain valuable experience and understanding of health disparities. The leadership and dedication of our faculty to move the boundaries of medicine forward with their research means extraordinary innovation and the best possible care for patients. I think that it's our, our sacred duty at wearing the white coat to, uh, to treat patients with respect and, and uh, for me it's very simple. I treat every patient like they're a family member and I try and train my trainees and lead by example and uh, pass that on to the next generation. I was um, overly impressed with Dr. Gami and I've known a number of the doctors here over the years. These gifts of life are forever remembered by patients with gratitude. It is the future of medicine coming into focus at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So I'm thankful and I'm grateful and I will never understand all the, how all the stars lined up to put Dr. Gammy in my path and the University of Maryland. Thank you, Dr. Gammy. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for making my heart whole.